Hey guys, welcome back to my channel and welcome to another episode of Where Is. If you're new to my channel, you're not familiar with Where Is. The Where Is is a series I started about a year ago to raise awareness about missing people around the world. Today we're talking about Jennifer Kessie and I will warn you, this case is incredibly frustrating. It really is going to leave you with no answers, which sucks. Um, but I would love to know all your guys' theories at the end of this because it's really like anything could have happened. This girl disappeared into thin air. Like it is bizarre. Before we get started, Started. Um, maybe you notice my shirt. This is the where is design for this month I finally realized I should start like ordering them I can show you guys in person in the videos what they look like So this is the new where is design. This was designed by a subscriber named Noreen So it's completely original and this is the first um, where is merch I've ever had like my name on it It also comes in white so white or black and if you buy one you can feel good about it because 100% of the money raised from those shirts goes directly to our buddy's thorn So the foundation called thorn Thorn, yes. uh, with my ex-wife and uh, and you know, we're building digital tools to fight human trafficking so basically like the 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 purchase and the commerce for human trafficking is happening online just like everything else sure. now and so we're building digital tools to fight back against it and we have built a tool to help law enforcement prioritize their caseload and we've identified and recovered over 6,000 wow, uh, trafficking awesome. victims this year. So there'll be a link for that in the description box if you want to pick up a shirt. They're available for 21 days. So this is Jennifer Joyce Kessie. She was born on May 20th of 1981 and she grew up in Tampa, Florida. And her parents describe her as someone who was extremely well liked and also really, really smart. She was speaking in sentences at only a year old and she was just a fantastic fantastic student. She had good markings. Teachers really liked her. She got along well in school, didn't get in trouble. She was like a good kid. She was super involved in school and her community and she had a ton of friends. And not only was she smart, she was also just very curious, very interested in everything, loved to learn about things, always willing to read, always willing to learn about something new. She was very inquisitive, constantly asking questions. Her mom described her as her very own doll, that she was just the perfect little girl. Jennifer graduated from Vivian Gaither High School, which I hope I'm saying that right but she also attended the University of Central Florida in Orlando in Tampa Florida and her parents and her were extremely close especially you know when she got into college um, I'm sure many of you have experienced this when you kind of leave home it's like a new dynamic like when you first come back and Jennifer's mom talked about you know her daughter came back from college and instantly they had this like adult relationship and I totally I remember the night I did that with my mom in fact I remember sitting in the garage with her like filling her in on college and stuff and really feeling like wow Wow, this is like we're like friends instead of a parent so you know they were at that stage with her she was a member of Alpha Delta Pi she graduated in 2003 with a degree in finance and she was offered several jobs when she graduated which is very nice it doesn't always happen like that but she finally decided to accept a position at a resort and this was called West Gate Resort and she was doing really well in her new job co-workers really liked her she enjoyed the job in fact she got three promotions within her first year she recently had purchased a condo a really nice condo and she was super proud of it because she paid for it with her own money and that's a big deal when you first get your first place without your parents helping you at all it's like you know it's a big deal it's exciting and she was in a really good place in her life it was right next to Mall of Millennia if you've ever been there it's this gigantic mall um, I go to Orlando all the time very familiar with the area and she got a condo right in that area brand new really really nice beautiful condo she also had a boyfriend his name was Rob Allen they actually had a long-distance relationship and when you're in a long-distance relationship normally you do a lot of trips together oftentimes when couples live in two different states they'll meet up somewhere at like a vacation destination for a weekend or whatever so they decided to go to st. Croix they had a great weekend a really good time and they came home on a Sunday night Sunday night when they got home Jennifer decided to just sleep at Rob's house it was just easier and then she woke up really early and drove back to Orlando and to her job and later that day after work she had a relaxing evening planned you know when you just go on a trip you're pretty tired you want to chill so that's kind of what she was planning on doing just relaxing alone which is my favorite thing to do and she talked on the phone with three people that night um, she talked to her mom she talked to her best friend and she talked to Rob this has been really really confusing but there are some sources that say that Rob and her got into a disagreement that night but I 
I'm not completely sure if that happened and Rob is not a person of interest. It's important to note that um, that night her phone was turned off sometime between whenever she got off the phone with people and when she woke up the next morning. Her phone was turned off and the battery was removed. She had also had a friend's phone with her and she was supposed to be sending it back so she powered off his phone, took out the battery and that was normal. She was supposed to do that she was sending this phone back. No one knows why her phone was turned off. The next morning, January 24th of 2006, Jennifer did not show up at her job that morning. This is really, really unusual for her. She is a grade A employee, definitely would tell people if she was gonna be late or wasn't gonna be there, and her boss thought it was extremely unusual. She had a meeting planned that day for 11 a.m., and her boss just was like, there's no way she just wouldn't come. Like, this is so odd, and they tried calling her, of course, and there was no answer. Her boss contacted her parents because they were listed as her emergency contact, and as soon as her parents found out about this, they were like, no way, there's no way Jennifer just didn't go to work like she's just not like that. So they tried calling her too and they obviously didn't get an answer. And the phone didn't even ring. It went straight to voicemail. And because of this, her parents knew that something was seriously wrong. Um, Jennifer wouldn't do this. This is completely out of character for her. In fact, her parents had taught her all about safety and responsibility and Jennifer was obsessed with safety actually and that is because her parents uh, years before their children were born were held up at gunpoint which I'd imagine would be terrifying after you go through an experience like that you just live your life differently and so in their family they were all extremely cautious um, Jennifer would constantly call her parents and friends when she was walking alone which is really really smart if you ever feel scared or in a, you're like this is creepy or it's late at night and I'm walking call someone just like anyone call your grandma be like I mean you know because if something happens to you then there's a witness someone knows what's going on someone can get help to you um, it's a really really smart idea so Jennifer was like all about you know safety and you know she's in a sorority and all the girls in the sorority would call her mother hen because she was always taking care of people and she was just like the leader of their group so her parents knew something was really really wrong Jennifer's parents called her boyfriend Rob he hadn't heard from her either and he actually said he was thinking it was a bit odd that she didn't call or text him Jennifer was all about a routine following a routine she texted or called her boyfriend every morning so for her to not do that was really really unusual but he thought she had a busy day and didn't read too much into it so the family couldn't get a hold of her for over an hour so they decided to drive to her apartment and on their way to the condo which was about two hours away from where they lived they called the condo complex and asked them to go check if Jennifer's car was there and her black Chevy Malibu was nowhere to be found when her parents got to the condo they went inside and everything looked normal. The only things that were missing from her condo were her cell phone, keys, purse, normal things that people take with them every time they leave. As they were looking around the condo, they noticed that a bottle of pepper spray was on her counter and she kept this next to her car keys and she always grabbed them both. It's very smart to carry pepper spray by the way guys. So the fact that she took the keys but not the pepper spray is concerning. There had been clothes laid out on her bed, it looked completely normal, and the shower, there was still water in the shower and a damp towel. So it seemed like something had happened to her that morning. So they decided to contact the police. When the police came, he said, looks like she had a fight with her boyfriend. She'll be back later. She just like ran away. And then he walked out. So excellent police work there. So her family called everyone that they could think of, hoping that maybe someone had talked to Jen. They printed out a ton of flyers and posted them around the you know condo, around the area, anywhere that they could. They even had family members and friends standing on street corners, passing out flyers and you know holding signs, waving people down, trying to get as many people to know about Jen Jennifer as possible. So the family was obviously trying to find her as quickly as possible, especially before sundown. I mean, that's just when, you know, nothing good happens after night. Her parents felt like if they could find her before the sun went down, maybe they'd have a good chance. But her parents also knew that 80% of people who are taken are killed and disposed of in the first three hours. So there are a few things to keep in mind about Jennifer's condominium. This building was a new building and the area kind of had some dicier areas surrounding it. There were rough patches and this was actually um, being converted from apartments to condos. So there was a ton of construction going on in this building. So there were constantly construction workers there. They were leaving the gates open for construction workers to get in and out without having to swipe through security or anything. So the gates were just open and Jennifer's complex had zero security cameras. Half of the units in this complex were still unoccupied so that makes it a lot less likely for someone to have seen something. 
thing, you know, less witnesses. And by 9 p.m. that night, sadly, they had not found Jennifer. Um, she was entered into the computers officially as a missing person and the media started reporting on the case. The thing is, is there was legitimately no sign of her. There was no clues, no details, no good leads. Finally, days later, on Thursday morning of that week, so Jennifer's been missing about four or five days now, a call came in from someone that lived in an apartment complex less than a mile away from Jennifer's place. And they reported seeing a car that looked like Jennifer in the parking lot of the complex. So the cops went there and they confirmed that it was Jennifer's car. So why the hell was she there? This was a more rough area and it's also known for drug activity, so that's important to keep in mind. Although Jennifer didn't do drugs. So the police decided to bring Rob with them to the car and have him kind of scope it out, see if anything had changed. And he noticed that the front seat was in a different position. You know how you can move your front seat based on how short you are and stuff? Mine's always like super close. It was moved further back than where Jennifer drove. Like he knew, you know, she needed to be certain distance forward because he was probably used to changing it back when he would drive. And he just thought it was so odd that it was set for someone else. There was a few things in the car, um, a DVD player, and this may not seem significant, but it actually is because it shows us that this person wasn't trying to steal from her. I know a DVD player doesn't sound that nice these days or that, you know, worth stealing, but, uh, you know, 2006, over 10 years ago, DVD players were the thing, they were new. So this person's objective was not to rob her or to take items from her. The amount of gas in the car tank showed that they hadn't driven very much. Luckily, this place did have a couple security cameras and it caught some footage of someone parking her car and getting out of it. However, this footage was too grainy to tell who it was. There was also some still pictures taken on a camera of the fence outside of the complex and this person walked by, they thought they had this person like they would have too and placement of their feet I mean it must have just been pure luck because you can't plan this but both of the pictures of this person cover their face like the fence posts cover their face so they haven't even been able to confirm a gender on this person a lot of people out there think it was a woman um, there's people that think it was a man there's all kinds of theories about who this person was but it just sucks because we have two pieces of good evidence here and one's too grainy and one's blocked by the fence so her parents are like what the hell? This was like, could have been our only chance to find Jennifer. So the police decided to bring some blood dogs in, see if they could sniff out any leads or any evidence. This is days later, and this dog traced Jennifer's scent all the way from that complex back to Jennifer's complex. The dog went immediately to the bushes next to her condo. Investigators decided to spend the next couple of days actually physically searching. So the area behind her complex, they were going through like a bunch of fields basically. You know, Florida, basically just lush space. Her father would identify things they found a shoe at one point and he said that that's just not Jen's. Like he knew her well enough to know what shoes she had. They didn't find anything though. So the following weekend they had 1,400 volunteers go out and look for Jen. So a few days later they actually decided to add Jennifer's ex-boyfriend, not Rob, ex-boyfriend to their list of possible suspects. Apparently her and her ex broke up a while back and he was devastated by it. I mean, he was in love with Jennifer. He wanted to be with her. He would beg her to get back together and she would say no and had to tell him multiple times, I'm not interested. Investigators found out that he had gone to a bar completely intoxicated across the street from her condo the night that she disappeared. He claims that he has nothing to do with her disappearance and there's no other evidence. They also are looking at the construction workers in the complex. Some of these workers were admitting to living in empty units and Jen had actually told her parents that she was uneasy about the amount of workers that were around and she would get like catcalled. They would like make eyes at her and stare at her and, and so she was constantly calling her parents when she was around them to just have that safety phone call. When the case started getting publicity, the workers started disappearing. Like they just poofed. There's some concern that maybe one of them was involved. Now, it was hard to track any of them down or find out who they were because they found out that like 90% of the people that were working on this complex were undocumented immigrants from various countries. But in that situation, it's really hard to track someone down. There's no documents on them. There's only a few that were actually registered and they investigated those men and could not connect any of them to her. There is one more theory though. One of her coworkers was really obsessed with her. She told her father several times that she was uncomfortable around this guy. Coworkers said that he would casually ask Jen out all the time at work and she told him that she never dates anyone in the workplace and it made him really upset. They also found out that he was late 
to work the morning that she went missing. And that same coworker at work made a comment about Jennifer saying that she was probably eaten by gators by now when he found out that she was missing. When the coworkers heard him say this, they contacted the police and let them know how sketchy that was. The guy was able to prove that he was late to work because he got a speeding ticket that morning. So after months of searching for Jen with no good leads, resources started dwindling, interest in Jen started dwindling, you know, there's less signs around and stuff, and months turn into years. But then in 2008, which was two years after she went missing, one of those construction workers that were questioned at the time of her disappearance was arrested for a statutory rape. When they spoke to him, they confirmed that he did work there when Jen went missing. He had actually been in her condo. Um, sometimes they had to come in and do work, and Jen being smart, Take notes on Jennifer, she sucks that this happened to her because she was one of the safest people I've like ever read about, but she was really smart. She got on the phone with her parents and stood in the doorway with the door open. She never closed the door behind her with strangers in her unit, which is a great, great tip. So the worker claimed that she would let them into their condo and not stay there. She would leave and tell them to lock the door on the way out. This is completely different from what she normally did and her dad said that he was a complete liar because last time they were in the condo, her dad was on the phone with her and she was standing in the doorway. But there is no link connecting Jen to this man. So they're continuing to try to get, you know, as many people to know about Jen as possible, you know, as many people to see Jennifer Kessie's face as possible. So sometimes they will, in jails, they will put uh, wanted people on the back of playing cards and inmates may have seen them. They put her face on a deck of playing cards. In December of 2008, a prison supervisor actually contacted the Kessies and told them that one of the inmates, someone on death row actually, recognized her. He claimed to have info on her but would only tell her father in a face-to-face -face meeting. The most likely scenario, and this is what I believe as well, is human trafficking. Human trafficking is so much more common, especially in the United States, way more than we would know. And around the time that Jen was taken, a huge ring was busted in Orlando. There is no evidence pointing to Jennifer being in that, but it's really, really common. And Years Without Answers has taken a terrible toll on Jennifer's family. Well, this weekend marks nine years since Jennifer Kessie disappeared in Orlando. Her case gained national attention in 2006. Police just released this new age progression photo of Kessie. You see it there. She was last seen at her condo in South Orlando, and police have received more than a thousand tips since then. Our taking action coverage to help find Jennifer Kessie continues nearly a decade later now. Her family, who lives in the Bay Area, have never given up hope she is still alive. It's a mission for me. In the last nine long years, there hasn't been a single moment when Joyce and Drew Kessie lost hope. They dream about one day seeing their girl again. I just can't believe it. Um, still can't believe that Jennifer was the victim of a heinous crime. Um, I can't believe she was stolen. Can't believe I haven't hugged her, kissed her, talked to her. Laugh with her. Her parents just seem like such good people. I feel so badly for them. I can't imagine just having no answers. The case is still active. They are still following leads, trying to find her. Um, but it's been a really, really long time. New this week, Orlando police releasing a photograph of what Jennifer may look like today. She would be 33 years old. And if you ask her parents, probably still flashing that beautiful Jennifer smile. And that's really where the story ends as of right now. Um, hopefully one day, Jennifer will be found. It's been more than a decade since Jennifer Cassie disappeared in Orlando. Despite years of searching, what happened to her remains a mystery. Today we're announcing an enhanced focus on the Jennifer Cassie investigation. Orlando Police Chief John Mina announced today his department is determined to find out what happened to Jennifer Kessie, who went missing in 2006. The chief showed off this Lynx bus wrapped with Kessie's photo, asking for the public's tips. The reward money in the case has also jumped to $15,000. So we continually investigate this case. Kessie's family stood behind the chief today, but after the news conference, they told us they're frustrated with Orlando Police. We are nowhere after 12 years. We are nowhere. Logan Kessie was 
was just 21 years old when his sister disappeared without a trace. Now, he says, the family hired their own private investigator to look into the case, and they're calling on OPD to make their files public. It's a joke, guys. This is the only reason this is going on is because we are putting pressure on them because we have attorneys involved now. Since Cussie vanished, only few clues have been made public, like her car recovered at the Huntington on the Greens condos. And because the case is considered active, OPD will not release the case files. So the family is now planning to take OPD to court to try to make them. We want answers, that's it. Doesn't matter, we want answers. We want to know what is going on. There's going to be a more detailed description of Jennifer in the description box, as well as information of how to get any info that you possibly could have on Jennifer. I mean, if you recognize her, please, if you have anything, even if it's small, there will be information in the description box to get that to the right people. Don't forget that 100% of the profit of this t-shirt is going to Thorn, which is working to help fight back against human trafficking. That's it for me today, guys. I hope you're having a good day. Stay safe, and I will see you next time. Bye. Always smile. Always smile. She's daddy's little girl. Always was. Since her disappearance, there have been tips. Dozens at a time. Thousands by now. In fact, 15 minutes before our interview, Drew got another through Facebook. It's exactly why they want Jennifer's face out there, and it's the driving force behind Joyce's moving billboard. When in doubt, make a call, what is the worst that could happen? You potentially could save someone. Miracles do happen. They've seen it, you've seen it. Until someone can definitively tell them Jennifer was murdered, they won't stop believing she's alive. <laughs> Where'd you go? Seems like it's been forever since you've been gone. Where'd you go?